This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 60. Coming up on Space Time, NASA's Perseverance rover starts its science mission on the Red Planet, a new theory on how Mars got its two moons, and Starlink and OneWeb have their first near-miss in orbit, averting collision by just 57 metres. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's newest Mars rover, Perseverance, has started its science mission, searching for signs of past microbial life and studying the geology of the ancient lake bed of Chesro Crater. Perseverance has been busy serving as a communications base station for the Ingenuity helicopter during the rotorcraft's historic test flights on the Red Planet. But the rover is now focusing on its own science mission, using its instruments on rocks and the Chesro Crater floor. The data these investigations turn out will help scientists create a timeline of when the ancient lake formed, when sediments began piling up in the river delta that formed in the lake, and when it all dried up. Understanding this timeline will help date rock samples to be collected later on in the mission, samples that might be preserving a history of ancient microbial life, if it ever existed on Mars. A camera called Watson at the end of the rover's robotic arm has taken detailed images of the rocks. And a pair of zoomable cameras that make up the MassCam-Z image on the rover's head has also surveyed the terrain. Scientists have already used a laser instrument called the SuperCam to zap some of the rocks in order to study their chemistry. These instruments, together with others, have allowed scientists to learn more about Jezero Crater and focus on areas worth further study. One important question scientists want answered is whether these rocks are sedimentary, like sandstone, or whether they're igneous, formed through volcanic activity. See, each type of rock tells a different kind of story. Some sedimentary rocks, formed in the presence of water from rock and mineral fragments like sand, silt and clay, are better suited to preserving biosignatures or signs of past life. Igneous rocks, on the other hand, are far more precise geological clocks that allow scientists to create an accurate timeline of how an area formed. One complicating factor is that the rocks around Perseverance have been eroded by wind over eons and then covered with younger sand and dust. Now, on Earth, a geologist would simply trudge into the field and break a rock sample open to get a better idea of its origins. Now, while Perseverance doesn't have a rock hammer, it does have other ways to peer past millennia's worth of dust. When scientists find an especially enticing rock, they can reach out with the rover's arm and use an abrader to literally grind and flatten the rock's surface, revealing its internal structure and composition. Scientists can then gather more detailed chemical and geological information using other instruments. It's all part of the prelude to what could be one of the most exciting scientific planetary assignments ever undertaken. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. Still to come, a new theory on how Mars got its moons. And Starlink and OneWeb have had their first close encounter in orbit, with two spacecraft missing each other by just 57 metres. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Scientists have come up with another new hypothesis to try and explain how Mars got its two moons, Phobos and Deimos. The origins of the Martian moons has long been an ongoing area of debate for astronomers. Compared to the Earth's dwarf planet-sized moon, the irregular potato-shaped Phobos and Deimos are tiny. Phobos is just 22 kilometres wide. That's 160 times smaller than the Earth's moon while Deimos is even smaller still at just 13 kilometres across. And their orbits are also very different. Phobos circles the red planet every seven and a half hours at an average distance of just 9,377 kilometres. Deimos, on the other hand, orbits at a more distant 23,460 kilometres in just over 30 hours. It's long been suggested that both are captured asteroids. The problem with that idea is that captured asteroids would have more eccentric orbits in random inclinations. 
On the other hand, their almost circular orbits along Mars's equatorial plane suggest that they formed around the red planet itself. But if they did form around Mars, how? One idea involves a large celestial body in orbit around Mars being impacted by another object causing both bodies to smash apart and eventually coalesce into Phobos and Deimos as we see them today. But a new hypothesis reported in Australian Sky and Telescope magazine suggests they were created by an object impacting the Martian surface and then blasting away ejecta into orbit which eventually coalesced to form the two moons. With the details, we're joined by Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. G'day, Stuart. Well, scientists are still trying to figure out how Mars came to acquire its two small potato-shaped moons called Phobos and Deimos. And these are tiny moons. They're nothing like our moon. They're just really, really small. Phobos, is in, as, a, as I say, it's potato-shaped, so it doesn't have a one particular dimension, but its average width is about 11 kilometres, which is about seven miles. Deimos is even smaller. It's only about six kilometres wide, so it's about three miles across or so. So they are really, really tiny, and they're the only moons that Mars has, and uh, and they just, they just trundle around the planet, uh, minding their own business. Um, Phobos is interesting because it's actually losing altitude as each day goes by. It's about two centimetres per year. It's drifting closer and closer to Mars. <clears throat> so they reckon in about 20, 30, 30 40 50, million yeah. years or so, yeah, it's either going to crash into the planet or be torn apart by tidal forces when it gets too close. No one's really sure yet what's going to happen, but, uh, but something One ring to, to rule them all. <laughs> <laughs> to rule them all, yeah. Well, we'll come to that because um, no one is sure yet how they came to be orbiting Mars. Uh, all sorts of hypotheses have been proposed over the years, but there are a couple that are currently in vogue with scientists. One has it that a large rocky body of some kind crashed into Mars a long time ago, and that spewed rocky debris out into orbit where these two moons finally coalesced. And there was probably lots of other debris floating around as well, but that, that eventually fell back down onto Mars and, and, the, and the sort of orbital space above Mars became cleared apart from just these two moons. Nothing really controversial about that. That sort of idea has been around for a long time. The other idea, though, is interesting, and it's, it starts with the same sort of collision with some big rocky body crashing into Mars, and that's then followed by the formation of lots and lots of moons orbiting around the planet that have formed from the debris that got thrown into orbit. But some of these moons will then eventually break up again due to tidal forces, and then you'll get a, a smaller number of moons forming out of the debris of them, and, and you just sort of rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, and, and you end up in the end with just two of them. So that, that's been taken seriously by a lot of people. So that could explain certain characteristics of why Deimos is further out and Phobos is closer in and how they ended up in their particular orbits and why Phobos is losing altitude slowly and yada, yada, yada. So no one really knows for sure yet, but those, those are the two main ideas. It's so a, still a huge lot to ongoing learn. debate, isn't it? We've got yeah. all sorts of hypotheses out there. I was reporting just the other week on another two options, one involving Phobos and Deimos being formed by a collision between two objects in orbit around Mars and then the other option is they were simply captured asteroids, but their orbits don't justify the captured asteroid story. So, no, that that used to be the main. A uh, long time ago, that used to be the main idea. They just because they look like asteroids, are about the size of asteroids, so they were probably captured asteroids. And that that was a very common thought. Seems pretty straightforward. An asteroid gets too close, gets captured into orbit. But that's they're, they're pretty certain now. That's just not the case for all sorts of reasons. Some of these mysteries, though, might be solved, or at least if not solved, we might have fit few more bits of information to plug into them uh, later this decade because Japan's going to be sending a mission there called the Martian Moons Exploration Mission. That's an imaginative title, isn't it? The Martian Moons Exploration Mission. And it's going to head towards, it's going to head to Phobos. It's going to launch in 2024. It's going to go to Phobos. It's going to land there and it's going to take some samples and blast off and bring them back. So that should be pretty specky. The Russians have tried this long, long time ago. Phobos um, Grunt, and yes. Yeah, 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 and and they um, it, it didn't it didn't work. There were a whole string of Mars mission failures back then. I still remember there was another mission called Mars ninety six that was sent off, and it got oh, launched. Yes. <laughs> got launched, and it, it didn't get out of Earth orbit. Really, it didn't even make it into Earth orbit that much. And I remember this because I woke up early that morning. And, this was a uh, proton rocket failure, wasn't it? it just, yeah, I think yeah. it was. And the word was that this thing was going to uh, come back down to Earth within the next orbit or two, and it might crash into Australia. Yeah, yeah. And and, and I I remember I, I was doing. I did lots of I was doing lots of radio stuff at the time, like, and I rang up the uh, the studio and said, "Hey, there's this big story. This Russian thing might be going to crash into uh, Australia, and it's got a bit of plutonium on board and all that sort of thing. So uh, it could be a problem." They said, "Oh, don't bother us with that. We've got really big, important political <laughs> things going on this morning." And blah blah blah. Well, they phoned me back 20 minutes later and said, "The prime minister is about to have a press conference about this." 
Yes. About this Russian thing coming down. Yes, yeah. Can you can you can you talk to us about it? <laughs> he and John Howard, the Prime Minister at the time, had a press conference about the possibility of this thing crashing into Australia. For Mars ninety six. Ah, oh, the good old days when missions to Mars failed all the time. Yes, sometimes because they simply confused imperial and metric measurements. Yes, all sorts of reasons. In fact, in the latest issue of Australian Sky and Telescope, my little editorial piece that I write each time, I make the point that Mars was the first planet that I had identified in the night sky when I was a teenager. It was the first one I learned how to pick out. It was pretty easy because it was red. So I've got a bit of a soft spot for Mars, and that was about 1980. Mm. Well, um, at the time, the Viking missions were on still on Mars, and it was the year after that, it was 1981, I think it was, that they switched off one of the Vikings, and a, and a few years after that, 86, I think it was, they switched off the other one. And then there was a, just a long period of a decade or more where other Mars missions were attempted, but they all failed. I mean, it, it took until 1997 when the Mars Pathfinder mission eventually got there with this little Sojourner rover to be the, the next successful mission after the Vikings. So there was a long period there where everything was just going wrong with uh, Mars missions and a few after uh, Pathfinder as well. But they obviously have, have learned their lessons because the, uh, the the missions look at perseverance, you know. They're, they're doing it really well these days. They, they know what they're doing. I remember staring at an image in the school library taken by one of the Viking landers from the surface of Mars and just looking at that then red landscape with this green sky. That's the way it looked in the newspaper image anyway. And I was just fascinated with it. I, I thought you were going to talk, uh, talk about Cydonia and the famous face on Mars. Oh, that came later. <laughs> that came later. Oh, that was a it's lot real, of... You know, it's real, you know. The old, the old face on it's Mars. aliens. And, and aliens, yeah, yeah. People made a lot of money out of that. That's Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing is easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again. This is Space Time. Still to come... Starlink and OneWeb have their closest encounter yet, with two of their satellites involved in a near miss, passing each other in orbit by just 57 metres. And the European Space Agency's Vega rocket returns to flight status following last year's multi-million dollar launch failure. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Starlink and OneWeb have had their first close call in orbit, with spacecraft from the two companies missing each other by just 57 metres. For years, scientists have been warning that the massive broadband internet satellite constellations now being launched by companies like SpaceX's Starlink and OneWeb are a recipe for disaster, with collisions inevitable. But despite the warnings, SpaceX has already launched well over 1,600 Starlink satellites, with some 30,000 more planned. And OneWeb is now joining the club, with 146 of its own spacecraft now in orbit and hundreds more expected. And now all those warnings are starting to come to fruition. The two companies received several red alerts from the US Space Force's 18th Space Control Squadron, warning of a possible imminent collision. The red alert came after the European Space Agency contracted Roscosmos to launch 36 OneWeb satellites on a Russian Soyuz rocket. Although the OneWeb satellites are designed to orbit at a higher altitude than the Starlink satellites, they still need to pass through the Starlink's orbits in order to reach their own operational orbital altitudes. And that's where things got tricky. The two spacecraft flew past each other at several tens of thousands of kilometres an hour, just 57 metres apart. SpaceX claims it has an artificial intelligence-powered automated collision avoidance system on each of its satellites but it decided instead to deactivate the system, allowing OneWeb to alter the course of one of its satellites instead. Now, on this occasion, the emergency avoidance manoeuvres were successful. But it raises the question, how many more close encounters will they face before a catastrophic collision actually occurs? And when that does, how long will it be before we end up with some sort of Kessler syndrome? where debris from one satellite collision ends up smashing into other spacecraft, causing further debris, which then cascades into yet more spacecraft, causing even further debris, eventually rendering space navigation impossible. This is Space Time, still to come. 
The European Space Agency returns Vega to flight status, successfully launching a Vega rocket for the first time since last November's multi-million dollar failure. And later in the science report, bipolar disorder found to have genetic links to schizophrenia and major depression. All that and much more still to come on Space Time. The European Space Agency has successfully launched its first Vega rocket since last November's multi-million dollar launch failure. The return to flight status mission from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana carried the Pleiades NEO-3 Earth observation satellite. The spacecraft is the first high-resolution satellite for a new Earth observation constellation operated by Airbus. A tous de DDO, attention pour les décomptes finales. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2... No, it's always something uh, very beautiful to look at. So, we're right, we're into it now. What happens? We track it now. Tell me what happens now. Yeah, now we are in the phase that we call the P80 phase. It's the name of the first stage boosters, which allows us to get far from the uh, launch pad. During this phase, uh, we burn solid propellant, so the name of P80 comes from the amount of propellant that we have on board, so it's roughly 80 tons of propellant, slightly more. And during these phases, the launcher provides its thrust and accelerations, and the separation of the stage will be triggered when the acceleration will uh, get below a predefined threshold in order to get used of this mass, which, which is uh, useless once you have used almost all the propellant inside. When will the first separation take place? Uh, the first separation uh, will take place around two minutes after liftoff, so we should uh, see it in a, few, in a few seconds. And this is the next really important yes. stage. Yes, and the separation of the PAC has just been confirmed, and we have the ignition of the second stage, which we call the Zephyr 23. So, confirmation, the first separation has gone ahead as planned, which is what we were looking for. No. What happens next? Now, it's uh, the, the job of the second stage, which will increase still the launcher velocity and the altitude in order to provide additional energy to the launcher. And then, when it will complete its job, it is exactly the same principle as for the P80. It means once we have used almost all the propellant that is inside the stage, we will trigger the separation, once again, based on uh, the detection of the acceleration. This whole operation is supposed to take, what, an hour and 40 between launch and dropping off all the different satellites? Uh, between the liftoff and the separation of the uh, Pleiade Neo 3, we have around 55 minutes, and up to the separation of the exterior passenger, one hour and 40 seconds, more or less. As well as the primary payload, the mission also carried the Norsat 3 Norwegian Observation Micro Satellite, which will be used to detect radar for maritime navigation, and four small CubeSats for operators Utilsat, Nano Avionics, Aurora Insight and Spire. The flight was the third from the Kourou spaceport this year and the 18th launch of a Vega rocket. The mission, Ariane Space Flight VV-18, came just six months after losing a Spanish Earth observation satellite and a French research probe during a spectacular November 17, 2020 launch failure. That was eventually traced to quality control manufacturing errors. It seems wires were crossed on the fourth stage thrust vector control actuators, causing the engine to move its nozzle in the wrong direction during ascent to orbit. The issue resulted in the rocket losing control and tumbling back into the sea after upper stage ignition around eight minutes into the flight. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new genetic study of 41,917 people with bipolar disorder has identified genetic links to both schizophrenia and to major depression. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Genetics, identified 64 genetic locations associated with bipolar disorders, 33 of which were new discoveries. 27 of the 64 genetic locations had previously been linked to schizophrenia, 
and seven had previously been linked to major depression. The study found that bipolar 1 was more genetically correlated with schizophrenia, while bipolar 2 is strongly correlated with major depression. A new study has found that 31% of dogs and 40% of cats tested positive to COVID-19 after their owners were also diagnosed with the disease. The findings, reported in the journal PLOS One, confirms that pet owners are passing on the illness to their four-legged companions. Researchers tested the pets of people in Rio de Janeiro who have been diagnosed with the disease between May and October 2020. In all, 29 dogs and 10 cats belonging to 21 COVID-19 patients were examined. Scientists found 9 dogs, or 31%, and 4 cats, 40%, from 10 households, that's 47.6%, containing COVID-19 sufferers, tested positive from 11 to 51 days after human COVID-19 cases experienced their first symptoms. The study shows that people with COVID-19 should avoid close contact with their pets during the time of their illness. Over 3.5 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 virus, with another 166 million infected since the deadly disease first emerged in Wuhan, China, and was spread around the world. A new species of ceratops, a horned dinosaur, has been identified in New Mexico. A report in the journal Pal Z claims that Minophy ceratops soleil was a relatively small ceratopsoid dinosaur, growing to around 4.6 metres or 15 feet. That's only about half the size of a full-grown triceratops. Fossilised parts of the herbivore's skull and lower jaws, forearm, hind limbs, pelvis, vertebrae and ribs were found in 82 million-year-old Cretaceous period strata from the Menifee Formation in northeastern New Mexico. Scientists have successfully sequenced and analysed the genomes of seven 2,000-year-old Judean date palms from Israel and Jordan. The findings, reported in the Journal of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, provides new insights into the spread of domesticated date palms across the region. Date palms are the iconic perennial plant of the deserts of Western Asia and Northern Africa. They're believed to have been domesticated around the Arabian Gulf some 7,000 years ago. Date palms grown in antiquity around Jericho and along the Dead Sea in Judea were referred to as Judean date palms but studying their original genomes has only become possible after several ancient seeds were germinated into viable plants. The seeds, radiocarbon dated from the 4th century BCE to the 2nd century in the Common Era, were recovered from archaeological sites at Masada, Qumram and Wadi Muka in the Judean desert. Scientists found that the oldest seeds from the 4th to the 1st century BCE are related to modern Western Asian date varieties but the more recent material showed increasing genetic affinities to present-day North African date palms. Well, despite society's growing dependence on science, it seems the anti-science movement is gaining strength globally. A report in the journal Scientific American puts the anti-science movement now on par with terrorism and nuclear proliferation as a significant threat to global security. Tim Menham from Australian Skeptics says rejection of mainstream science and medicine has become a key feature of the political extreme in the United States and increasingly around the rest of the world. Anti-science is, is, is an issue. It's, it's been an issue for a while. The Scientific American article points out about the problems in Stalinist Russia in the 30s and 40s when a fellow named Lysenko was a scientist who got the ear of Stalin and was promoting all sorts of pseudoscience about agriculture, specifically about a whole range of things, anything that was against it was Western propaganda. And Stalin put this guy's Lysenko's um, prognostications into practice and they basically had catastrophic harvest failures, famine, and a lot of people died because of it. They starved to death in Russia because of this anti-science person who had the ear of the people of power. Lysenko's thing was pure politics. People um, do get science. scared when they hear about chimera monkey human hybrid cells and things like this. That, there, that, there are certainly you know, areas where, that, where that people do get... That sort of stuff, that Frankenstein yeah. sort of stuff does get scary and People are concerned about that. They are, and and yeah, understandably. I mean, yeah, the same thing you can easily say towards the, the vaccines when politicians are saying, "Look, we got this in one year, where it normally takes five to ten years." You think well, that's going to scare people, and understandably, you make them hesitant at the very least towards uh, having their as it has proved to be 
about vaccines. You think, well, why does it well, only take five to ten years? Stuff now, yeah. And, and I know we've discussed this before, actually, but you can understand people being concerned about that. That it's almost too quick, you know. But um, too successful, which is obviously there are issues which have arisen, which people say is there. See, told you so. I shouldn't have done it in one year. But generally speaking, there is a an anti-science movement based on politics and ignorance. How's that for a broad brush statement? But uh, definitive if nothing else. But uh, there often has been people anti-science, but this is on a scale now where you're probably sort of seeing it in many, many areas where you can almost, if you say you're a scientist, you should be embarrassed, almost as embarrassing as being an accountant. Or a journalist. Or a journalist, yeah. <laughs> That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 